So, today I have one goal, which is to connect two different topics that we talked about this week. So our goal is essentially to connect references, which we introduced on Wednesday, back to polymorphism, which we last talked about on Monday. And hopefully, this is a chance to kind of bring these concepts together in a way that will allow both of them to make more sense. All right, so let's review a little bit about polymorphism. So remember that Java organizes all classes into a tree with a single root. So if I don't explicitly extend another class, which puts me down here in the tree, then my parent is object. So capital object is the parent class of every Java class, and so every Java class has a parent, except for one capital O object, right? What this means is that the methods that we provide, remember that I inherit methods and properties, uh, instance variables and instance methods, from all of the classes above me in this hierarchy. And what that means is that any of the methods, or in this case, just methods, but any of the methods or properties, instance variables, provided by the root object are inherited by everybody, okay? Um, and so this means we talked about several of these methods, right? That there are a small number of really important methods that every single Java object has by virtue of inheriting them from capital O object. These methods um, were to string, converts an object, uh, returns a string representation of an object, um, equals, which tests whether or not one object is equal to another, and hash code, which returns an int. We will talk more about what hash code is used for later in the class, okay? But these are the three methods provided by capital O object that we know if we're working with an object in Java, it's going to have these methods. We don't know how they're implemented, but we know that we can call them. We can call, for example, to string, pass no arguments, and expect to get a string back that we can then print to the console or whatever, okay? Now, the other thing that we can do in Java, that one of the reasons this whole system works in the first place, is that even though I'm guaranteed to have access to these methods on every Java object, I don't have to content myself with using the default implementations that are provided by capital O object. These are rarely useful. They're defaults. Um, capital O object doesn't know anything about your class. And so, for example, it doesn't know how to print your class. It just prints this very, very unhelpful representation that consists of the name of the class and its location in memory. That's the only thing that, that it really knows about it, right? So if I want to override these methods in a way that's more appropriate for my specific class, the specific class that I'm designing, I can do that, right? So here I have a dog class. Dog implicitly extends object. And so initially, it will inherit object's toString method, but what I've done is I've overridden that method by providing my own implementation with the same signature. So to override a method, I have to provide a method with the same signature, same name, same return type, same visibility, in this case it's public. And now when I call toString on an instance of the dog class, this is the implementation that gets used. I don't get the default implementation provided by capital O object, I get my own specific implementation provided by my class, okay? And remember that when, I, when, when Java actually tries to find out what method should I run, right? So when I call toString on any Java object, the process works something like the following. So I start, Java starts with that class that the object is. Talk about what this means in a minute, right? That was the class to the right of new when I created the object. That's where it starts looking. It looks for a method matching that signature. If it doesn't find one defined by that class, then it looks in the parent class. If it doesn't find one in the parent, it looks in the parent's parent. And it continues to do this until it either reaches capital O object or fails because there's no uh, class that provides that method, okay? So again, I start in the class, I look for it there, and then I keep going up, right? So I search up the tree. All right, so, and then here, you know, this was our example that we did. We had this, we created this fairly long class hierarchy where 
sweet old dog has old dog as a parent, which has dog as a parent, which has pet as a parent, which has animal as a parent, which has object as a parent. So now I have this class hierarchy that's like five or six levels deep. And you'll see here that right now, if I call to string, what's the type of this object? What's to the right of new? This is a sweet old dog. So what Java does is it says, does sweet old dog override to string? No. Does old dog override to string? No. Does dog override to string? No. Does pet override to string? No. Does animal override to string? Yes. And so I can put, if I can type today, I can put my, um, my overridden to string method. Let's see. Say I'm a dog. I can put that anywhere here, and it will get found, right? Depending on where I start. Now, if I change Choo Choo from being a sweet old dog to being a pet, then you'll see that I'm going to get that animal one because I started in pet. So pet is one of old dog's parents. So I don't get the, sorry, this should say I'm an old dog. So I don't get the two-string provided by old dog. I get the two-string provided by animal. Okay, so again, this is just sort of a review about how polymorphism works or how actually hierarchical name resolution works, right? So when we introduced polymorphism, we pointed out that because every Java object really inherits behavior from at least two classes, so its own class and then capital O object, Right, so if you create a class in Java, or if you use any useful class in Java, capital object is not a useful class, okay? We we'll almost never use that except if we're doing some sort of silly example or something. If you create a class in Java, that class has its own behavior that you define, but then it also might inherit some behavior from capital O object, at least. If you extend another class, then you inherit the behavior from that class and from capital O object, and from any other classes that are in between where your class is in the object hierarchy and capital O object. So what this allows is that an instance of that class can now behave like any of its ancestors in the tree. So if we go back here, we can say that sweet old dog, if I create a sweet old dog, a sweet old dog can act like a sweet old dog, but it's also still an old dog. So it can act like an old dog. It's also still a dog, so it can act like a dog. Right? It can morph into any one of these other classes that it extends from, because it preserves all of those behaviors. It may change them, it may override them, but it still has any of the behaviors or the, the methods and the instance variables that were created on its parent classes. And so I can treat an old dog like an old dog, but I can also treat it like a pet. Uh, it can morph into different types of objects. Okay? Next week, we're going to talk about a different form of polymorphism that's, um, that's known as, uh, well, that uses something called interfaces, right? Um, and we'll make clear exactly what an interface is. That's one of the more powerful concepts that we talk about in this class. So we'll get there on Monday. Well, we'll start that topic next week. But for today, today, we're going to focus on just looking at this from the perspective of using some examples with the object hierarchy, right? So in, any, in Java, any object can be referred to. So here's where these two topics are starting to come together, right? It's a little different than the first time we looked at polymorphism, because now we know about reference variables, and now we can be more accurate about how we talk about this, okay? So specifically, if I have a pet, I can also store a reference to it in a reference variable that stores an object. So I can refer to it as an object. I can also refer to a dog, in this case, as either a pet or an object. So now what we're doing, let's, well, where's the next thing? Okay, let's get here, right? So now what we're doing, and this is, this is in combination with upcasting, is we're distinguishing between the reference type, which is on the left side. So here, on line nine, I'm creating a reference variable called choo-choo. This is what we talked about on Wednesday. This variable doesn't store the object, it stores a reference to the object. This variable can store a reference to any object that can behave like a dog. So it can store a reference to a dog, but it can also store a reference to anything that extends dog, okay? Here, on the right side of this assignment, what kind of object is it 
It's a dog that's on the right side of new. So again, whenever you want to figure out what kind of object is it, look to the right of new. What kind of reference variable is it? We look over here to the left of the assignment. So here I'm creating an object of type dog, and I'm storing a reference to it in a reference variable that can store references to dogs. Same thing on line 10. Now here, let's do this. Now let's, now let's start to change this a little bit. So is this going to work? So now what am I doing? I'm creating an object of type dog on the right side of line 10. And then I'm storing a reference to it, or I'm trying to store a reference to it, in a variable that can store references to, to pets. Will this work? Who thinks it will work? Who thinks it's not going to work? Okay, let's try it. Works. Why? So again, we haven't really talked about this so much, right? Most of the time when we've been using a reference variable, it's been the same type as the object it refers to. Why does this work? Somebody explain it to me. So I think it's clear why line nine works, right? But why does line 10 work? Why can I store a reference to a pet in a reference variable that stores references, sorry, why can I store a reference to an object that's a dog into a reference variable that can store pets? There's a good one word answer to this. A concept that we've been talking about recently. Someone explain it to me. Or just give me the one word Java buzzword answer. Yeah. Polymorphism. Dog extends pet, meaning that every dog can also behave like a pet, meaning that I can refer to every dog as a pet, meaning that I can store a reference to a dog in a reference variable that can store references to pets. Okay? That pet reference variable, let me call it pet, can store a reference to anything that extends pet. So let's try this again. Well, well, let's create another. Okay, I'm gonna create a cat class. I can store cats. Oh, it's mad at me because I changed the name of this. And now it's mad at me because of that. Okay. I can store cats in that reference variable that stores pets. I can, I can store anything that can behave like a pet. So anything that extends pet. I can create another class here. I can store a reference to my ferret. So anything that can behave like a pet. So that's a pet, anything that extends pet. And actually anything that descends from pet. Right? Because anything that descends from pet can behave like a pet. And if it can behave like a pet, I can refer to it as a pet, right? Let's try a different example. So now let's say, is this going to work? All right, so now on line nine, what am I doing? I have, what, what's the type of the object that's being created? Pet. What's the type of the reference variable? It's a cat. It's what's on the left. Can, a, can every pet behave like a cat? No, right? What about dogs? Dogs are pets, but they're not cats. What about ferrets, right? Ferrets are pets, but they're not cats. So in this case, every pet cannot morph into a cat. Cat inherits from pet. So if I try to do this, my code is not going to compile. Java is going to tell me a pet cannot be converted to a cat. Really what it means here is not every pet can morph into a cat, right? Cat is below pet on the inheritance tree. Okay, so this will work. Let's see, let's put this back to pet. So I can put a pet in here, I can put a cat in here, I can put a dog in here. But if I put something over here, I can put dogs. I can't put cats either, right? Cat and dog are siblings in the tree, right? They both inherit from pet, but I can't, I can't refer to a cat as a dog, okay? 
All right, this we can skip, I think. Um, so we talked, and, and, and what we've been talking about here is essentially the way that Java will upcast things for me. So if I change, if, if I look at, let's just focus in on line 11, what's happening is the object's being created as a ferret, and then Java is automatically allowing me to refer to it as one of its ancestors in the tree. So I can automatically refer to it as a pet. Okay, so the upcasting will hap happen automatically, if I want to downcast, I have to do this explicitly. So we looked at this, right? So here's an example. This is another good one to think through. On line nine, on the right side, I'm creating a dog. That's the type of object. Always look to the right side of new. But I'm storing it into a reference variable that can store any object. Okay, so now I can print it, and then down here, I can downcast it, right? So now I'm taking an object variable and I'm storing it into a variable that can only refer to a pet. And on line 12, Java forces me to use this cast because I'm doing something that could potentially not work, right? Not every object can be referred to as a pet. So for example, if I did this, I create a string, now, when I run the code, I actually get an error on line 11. The error is generated because what I have is a string that I've been referring to as an object, and I'm trying to downcast it to something that it can't be converted to. Okay, we talked about the instance of operator last time. This allows me to test to make sure that uh, things are safe when I do this cast, right? So if I have something, in this case, I have a pet, my pet could be a cat or a dog, and so I can use the instance of operator to test whether or not it's a cat or a dog, right? You guys have used this on the homework. All right, any questions on the sort of quick review of polymorphism? This is, this is again, this is complicated stuff. It requires you think about the relationships and thinks about what it means for an object to be one type of object or another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so if it's a parent, you... So remember, when I create an object, that object has a type, right? There aren't other objects that are created alongside it, right? So in Java, this is a good question, right? In Java, when I create an object, I create one thing. That object has a class that establishes a relationship with other objects um, that have similar or different behavior but I still have only created one object. If I lose a reference to that object, that object is deleted, right? Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the class hierarchy is sort of uh, not, not an important part of that decision. Okay. So now let's fast forward to Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we started to become more accurate about how we refer to what is actually stored in the variables that we use to work with objects. These variables don't store the object itself, they store a reference to the object. A reference is something that I can use to find the object. It's a way to refer to the object. It's not the object itself. So if I copy the contents of a reference variable into another reference variable, I don't have two objects, I have two references to the same object. Any changes that I make using one reference variable will be visible to someone who has the other reference variable. We talked about some good analogs of this in the real world, right? A home address is a reference, it's not the house. Make a copy of the address, you don't have two houses. Make a change to the house by using the address, that change is visible to other people that have that address. What we didn't talk about last time, and what I wanna cover uh, today before we go on and, and delve into the kind of the relationship between these two topics a little bit more, is how to actually copy an object in Java. So let's say I have an object and I really want a copy of the object. I want there to be two objects with the same contents. The question is how to do it, okay? So you might think that there's this shortcut here because one of the methods provided by a capital object is something called clone, okay? Unfortunately, clone doesn't really do the right thing. It doesn't actually work in the way that you would expect. So instead, 
what you can do if you want to copy your class is you can provide a constructor that's called a copy constructor. So here's an example. I have a person class with a single field. I have one constructor that allows me to create a new person and set their age. And I've created a second constructor. This is good review, right? So first constructor is on line three. Name of the constructor shares the name of the class. There's no return type. Second constructor is on line six. The second constructor is interesting. As an argument, it takes a reference to another person object. And what it does is it copies the fields, in this case just one, but you could copy all of them or some subset of them. It copies the fields from that other person object into the new person object. So what you get back is a copy. Again, this is called a copy constructor. So if I have an instance of person and I want a new instance of person with the same age, I can call the copy constructor and when I get back, is a new object that has the identical content of the original one. Now notice that this is up to you to create when you design your class. You have to provide this. If you don't provide it, it doesn't, you don't, your class doesn't have a copy constructor, right? Um, all right, we'll look at those in a sec. So, so let's go back and try to re untangle, kind of reinforce the detanglement of objects versus references, right? So again, the only way to create a new object in Java is to use the new keyword. If you don't see new, there's no new object, period. This is a hard and fast rule, okay? If you don't see new, there is no object being created. That's the only way to create a new object in Java. It's called new. The variables used to store them actually store references to those objects. If you see a reference being copied to another reference, the object is not being copied. There's no call to new. Instead, I have a new reference that's receiving a copy of the other reference. I have two references to the same object, okay? So again, let's look at what happens here. And we're also, we start to distinguish between the two types, right? The reference variable has a type, and the object that it stores has a type, okay? The instance type is whatever's to the right of new. So on line five, I'm declaring a reference variable called choo-choo that can store references to anything of type dog or anything that can morph to a dog, so anything that extends dog, anything that inherits from dog. I'm initializing it to store the result of creating a new dog. So I'm actually creating a new object on the right side of this. So the instance type here is dog and the reference type here is dog. And this is pretty common, it's pretty common to see the two be the same. A lot of the code you write, that's what it's gonna look like. However, I can also do this. So on line six, I'm creating an instance, I'm creating a reference variable of type object. This reference variable can store references to anything that can behave like an object. So any Java object, I can store a reference to it in this choo choo as object variable. What I'm initializing it to hold is an instance of dog. That's what's being created on the right side. So the instance type is dog. That's, that's the right of new. The reference type is object. This is okay because every Java object inherits from capital O object. So I know that I can safely cast an, a reference of a dog to a reference of type object. That's an upcast. I'm casting it to one of its ancestors in the tree. I can also, sometimes I do a cast when I assign one reference variable to another. So here, I'm taking, I'm creating a reference variable called pet. This is a new reference variable, but it's not a new object. You don't see new on the right side, so I'm copying references. But this reference variable stores references to anything that can behave like a pet. Choo choo is a dog. And choo -choo, the choo-choo reference variable stores anything that stores a reference to a dog. But I know that anything that stores reference to a dog can behave like a pet because dog extends pet. So this is safe to do. Here, I'm doing a downcast. So this is an upcast and it happens automatically. There's no need to tell Java to do it. Here, I'm doing a downcast and now again, I do need to explicitly tell Java to do this for me. So here on the right side, I have a reference variable, so this one is probably the most confusing. 
This reference variable can store a reference to any Java object. But I know at this point in my program that it's storing a reference to something that's a dog. So here what I'm doing, ChooChoo can only store references to objects that can behave like a dog. So dog or anything that extends from dog. Here I'm explicitly telling Java, I want you to take the reference that's stored in ChooChoo as object. And I know that it might not actually be a dog. Here I know it's a dog, but it could be some other type of thing, right? But here, because I set it to dog, I'm very confident that this actually refers to a dog, and I want you to downcast it for me. And in order to do that, I have to force Java to do it using a cast. So this is required. The reason I have to do this is because this can fail, right? If I'm wrong, and Chuchu as object actually stores like a string, this cast will fail and the program will crash, all right? So again, here we're distinguishing between the instance type that's the kind of object something actually is, and the reference type. That's how it's being referred to in the program. And the reference type determines for a reference variable what types of objects it's allowed to store, okay? All right, Whew, this is hard to talk about. I'm sure it's very, very difficult to listen to. Um, but this is, this is what it is. Um, now we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna tie these two concepts together. So this is where this, this really comes, these, these two things start to intersect. Okay. So in Java, it's the type of the reference variable that determines what we can do with that variable. It's not the actual type of the object that's stored in that, that's referred to, it's the type of the reference variable, okay? And actually, there we go, okay. I've got, a, I've got a little playground here, all right? All right, so let's go through this step by step. Let me just go through the setup here. So I've got a pet class. Um, we'll talk about what abstract means in a second. For now, you can, you can ignore this. Um, I've got a dog class, and I've got a cat class, all right? Cat and dog both extend pet. Pet extends object. All right, so on line 18, I declare a reference variable named ChuChu that can store references to dogs and anything that can behave like a dog. And I initialize it to store a reference to a new dog. And then I do three things. I print it on line 21, but I also call two methods. The first method I call is bark, the second method I call is get owner. Bark is a method that only exists on dogs, right? It's defined in the dog class. Meow is a similar method that only exists on cats. Get owner is a method that exists on pets. So every pet has a get owner method, but only dogs have a bark method and only cats have a meow method. Because Choo Choo, because the reference type of this variable is dog, Java allows me to do anything with it that I can do with any dog. So everything that I can refer to as a dog has a bark method, it has a get owner method that it inherited from pet, and I can print it. I can print anything, right? Okay, so that's gonna work fine. Now let's go down here and let's look at, and actually here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna put a return statement in here. Uh, is check style going to be mad? It might be. Oh yeah, okay. Let's just comment this out. Oh, error. Oh. There we go. Okay, good. So I have choo choo is a reference variable of type dog. So I can, again, I can call any of the methods on that variable that I can call if I know something's a dog. So here, I know the dog can bark. It's defined in the dog class. I know that every dog has a get owner method. It's defined in its parent class. And I know that every dog has a two string method. That's defined in capital O object, okay? Now let's look at the next example here. This is what we're used to, right? This is kind of where we're coming from in terms of just, you know, not 
being used to the reference type being used being the same as the instance type. So in the second example, wait, sorry, let me do it. Let me just put the, uh, I'll put the new dog over here rather than choo choo. There you go. All right, so now, what's different about this? I'm still creating a dog. That hasn't changed. But the reference type is pet. So the type of my reference variable is pet. So now the question is, can I call bark? Let's try it. Can I call get owner? Can I call to string? So if you try to run this, you get this strange error. It says, can't find symbol. Okay? Why? Someone tell me why this doesn't work, right? At first glance, it feels like it should work. Okay? Right? Because Choo Choo's a dog, right? Choo Choo as pet is a dog. I created it over here. It's a dog. Dogs can bark, right? Why is Java getting on about this? I don't understand. Yeah. Because the reference type is a pet. So what could I do here? Right? What is, so Java's trying to help me, right? Because how can I change this in a way that I know it wouldn't work? So right now, this is weird because I feel like, why don't you just at least try to bark? Come on. Just humor me, right? Have the, have the pet thing try to bark and see what happens, right? How can I change this to make it more clear that this doesn't work? Somebody show me a modification to this that will help us understand this, right? What other type of object can I store in a pet? Store cats. So the reason that I can't call bark is because pet Choo Choo as pet can store, because the reference type is pet, it can store either a dog or a cat. So if what's referred to by Choo Choo as pet is actually a cat, then it's very clear that I shouldn't be able to call bark, because cats don't have a bark method, okay? So the way to think about it is, the reference type is used by Java to figure out what methods are safe to call. Because the reference type is pet. What Java does is it says, what methods do I know I can call whenever I have a pet reference? One of them is get owner, because that's defined on the pet class. Another one is to string, because that's defined on capital O object. So if I comment this out, works fine. And now I can store a cat or a dog in this variable, and I don't, I don't have any problems. Okay. Questions about this, right? If you're so, if you're coming from Python, I haven't. I'm going to just say something that may or may not be true. Hopefully, somebody will correct me on the forum uh, later. If you're coming from Python, um, this is different, okay? And the reason is uh, what Python will do in this. So let's go back and let's try this. So what Python will do here is it'll actually just try barking. That's how Python handles the situation. Python has this, uh, Python defined this term that's called duck typing, right? So duck typing, has anyone ever heard this phrase before? So in Java, the compiler will guarantee that I can only do things with a pet that it knows are safe to do with the pet. Okay, so Java knows that not every pet can bark because cats are pets and cats don't have a bark method. In Python, what happens is it'll just try it, see if it works, right? And so what happens is if it happens to be a dog, your code works fine. If what's in there happens to be a cat, it crashes, right? Um, Python's term for this is called duck typing. It means if it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck, right? That's how you tell what something is, right? You watch what it does. So in Python, what it would say is, if the object has a bark method, then it's a dog, and I can treat it like one. I don't need to know that ahead of time. Java's more strict. Java says, I need to be able to guarantee that anything that you can store in Choo Choo as pet has a bark method. If I can't guarantee that, then, it's, then I'm not gonna do it. Okay, so now let's go down and look at the final example. All right, so. Put, put 
and my comment here. Now, new dog. Okay. So now, last thing I'm doing here. So now I'm creating a dog. My object type is still dog, but my reference type is object. And so now, again, Java is going to make sure that anything I call on this reference is something that I can call on anything that could be referred to by that variable. So any object. So now I can't even call get owner, right? I can put this back, but if I try it, it's going to say it can't find that method, okay? Because not every object has a get owner method, right? What can I call on this? I can call, essentially call to string, which is what happens when I print it. That's it, right? And again, the reason for this is that I could change the right side of this expression to be string, and it still has to work, right? So Java is gonna guarantee, or Java is gonna limit me to only being able to call methods on a reference that I could call if, you know, depend, regardless of what kind of object is actually being referred to by that reference. So here I can only use things that could be called on every object, okay? All right, let's take a, take a breather. Questions about this? Again, I think, you know, this is one of those things, you're not gonna get it now, you know? You know, take a break over the weekend, come back, we'll have some more homework problems on this, keep thinking about it. Um, it, it, it will start to come together. This does become more natural to think about. Um, all right, so, but, but let, me, let me try to explain why, okay? And this, this is, un, you know, we probably should have started here, right? We've been talking about this fairly complex concept. It's very powerful, but, you know, it's not clear exactly what, what the purpose of this is, okay? And to, to some degree, this gets us into the purpose of Java's type system in the first place. So why organize classes in this way? Why do I have this hierarchy? Why do I have a capital O object that's at the top of the tree? Why do I have inheritance? There are other ways to organize categories of things, right? This is one that Java chose, but there are some benefits here, right? So let's try to talk a little bit about what's behind this whole thing, okay? So the idea here is that by extending another class, I can not only add new behaviors, a new state, I might have more data than the original class stored, or I might want to add my own methods, but I can also customize the behavior of my ancestors by overriding those methods, right? But they still exist, right? That's actually one of the most important things about this that I don't think we pointed out. In Java, there is no way to refuse to implement a method that you inherit from your ancestors. So if you're an object in Java, you don't get to not buy into toString. You can't be like, nope, I am not implementing toString. You can implement toString, but then what you get is one of the default implementations above you. You can't say, my object cannot be printed. I just don't like being printed. It makes me feel like an object, right? You can't do that. If you could, then this would throw, the, this whole system would, would have kind of no purpose, right? I know that any Java object I can call toString. The output may not be very useful, but I know that I can call that method safe. Polymorphism, the idea behind polymorphism is I can, one of the things I get out of this is that I can now write methods that work on entire classes of objects, even ones that I don't have to know anything about. So then this may seem abstract right now, but after spring break, we get to like the most fun part of the class. Where we're actually gonna talk about some basic data structures and algorithms that use them. And we're gonna write together some data structures that you can use to store any type of Java object, including ones that you've never heard of. You could use these, you know, this semester, next semester, you could write a library that works for any type of Java object. You don't have to know about it. All you need to know about it is that it provides hash code or two string or whatever. So this actually turns out to create an enormous amount of power in generality. It's possible, and again, we're gonna see how to do this, it's possible to write various um, libraries that work in Java, that work for all Java objects, without knowing anything 
about the specific implementations of those objects. All you need to know is that the object provides hash code, for example. And then I can create a map, which is something that we'll do. Okay. Polymorphism also exposes this trade-off. And this is an interesting trade-off and, and one that we'll, we'll think about again later in class, right? Um, you know, a, a good deal of modern software development is making these sort of trade-offs, right? There's no hard and fast rules about things in computer, very few in computer science. A lot of it has to do with how do you make various uh, choices between two desirable alternatives, right? Polymorphism exposes one of these. So if I write a method that works for all Java objects, then the good thing is it works for all Java objects. The bad thing is there's only a small number of methods that I can actually use. So if you write a function that takes an object as an argument, I can pass anything to it. That's the good part. The bad part is you can only use two string hash code equals and those other methods that are provided by capital object. As you go down, so let's say that instead you, your method takes a pet or a dog using our previous example. So if you take a pet, now you know you can call get owner. If you take a dog, you can call bark. So as you go lower down in the object tree, you can do more with the objects that your method works with. But your method works with fewer objects. That's the trade-off. Higher on the tree, more objects that you can work with, fewer capabilities. Lower on the tree, fewer objects you can work with, but more capabilities. You know more about what they can do, right? You can use those features if you need to. So let me try to put this in sort of metaphor terms. First of all, I would highly suggest not getting on a plane right now. Um, but let's say that sometime in the future you meet somebody on a plane. Um, now imagine you start talking with them, okay? Initially, you might not know anything about them. Maybe you're perceptive and you notice them wearing something or reading something and you start to make some guesses about what they do or where they're from or whatever. But let's say just like as a human being, what can you talk to them about? Well, there's, there's plenty of things, right? The weather, you know, why are you going to wherever you're going? Why? I mean, there's some common topics. But if you find out more about them, okay? So let's say you find out that they're also a student, okay? So now you know more about them. Now, the probability they're a student isn't 100% because there's other types of people, right? But now you find out they're a student. So they say, oh, okay, well, now we can talk about our classes. We can talk about you know, internships we're applying for, what we're going to do after graduation, right? And now you find out that they're actually a student at the University of Illinois. If you fly out of our tiny airport, that's pretty likely, right? So now it's like, okay, we can talk about, you know, what are you, what are you doing for spring break? You know, uh, what part of Naperville are you from? Um, you know, these, these, these various things that you can talk about with, with people that are from, that you know are from the University of Illinois, right? Um, and then let's say you find out there's a student in this class, okay? And now you'd be like, oh man, that last MP was a real killer, you know, whatever, right? Um, so the idea here is that as you know more about this person, there's smaller and smaller groups of people that fit into that category, but the way that you can uh, engage with them broadens. So there's more topics to talk about, you have more in common, right? It's not a perfect metaphor, but it's not a bad one either, right? I'm sure you've had that experience when you've You've tried to talk to somebody, maybe on a plane or at a family reunion or at a restaurant or whatever, and you just kind of realize, like, you have nothing in common, right? You're just stuck up at the top level. You're both people in the world, so you can talk about the weather and, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, but but like, you have so little in common with them, there's not a lot that you can talk to them about. Although there still is, to be honest, right? All right. I don't know what my plan was to do with this example, but... Um, Questions on this, on this idea? I have a few more little bits of class design to get through, and then I will <laughs> release you from today's torture. Um, all right. Two other things. Uh, I got a little, uh, we, we slowed down a little bit on Wednesday, which is great, but we missed a couple of things. A couple more tools in your arsenal for designing classes that I just want to review quickly. Um, final, right? A final class cannot be extended. These are pretty simple ideas, okay? Once I mark a class as final, I can't create a child of that class. I can't extend that class, right? So here, for example, 
um, I've marked dog as final, and then I can't extend dog. And actually, it turns out that there are final classes that you already know about. Um, let's go back here, let's say, if I try to extend string, I'm gonna get an error when I try to run this. Yeah, so string is a final class, right? <laughs> string cannot be extended. Um, okay, so that's one keyword. Uh, the second one, abstract. I'm, I'm going through these quickly because, um, you know, this is sort of part of our Java keyword bingo, but we don't actually do a lot with these in this class. But they're, they're important to know about, right? You get a sense of the capabilities that Java's class system provides you, okay? So ab abstract is interesting. A final class can't be extended. An abstract class can only be extended. You can't create an instance of an abstract class, but you can extend it, okay? So if you look, let's go back to our, we actually used this on our example a few minutes ago. Where'd it go? Yeah, right here. So I'm back at the, the pet and dog example. You'll notice that I marked pet as abstract. So down here, let's go back to the place where I was using a pet reference. Right, so I can, Pet can store a dog, um, it can store a cat. Get rid of this because it's causing my program to not compile. So I can store a cat in my pet reference, I can store a dog in my pet reference, but if I try to store an actual pet, I'll get this error that it can't be instantiated. The reason is that it's abstract. And this is pretty common, right? Like for, so for example, I might want to require in my little animal hierarchy system that like if you want to have a certain type of pet, you have to create a descendant of pet to represent that type of pet. You can't just create a, a, a there's no such thing as a general pet. Every pet has a type, right? You might need to add a new class to the class system to represent your type of pet, but you shouldn't just be able to create a generic pet. Right? All right, so we did this. Oh, okay, so, so let me, just, just last, um, last little note here on class design. So you might have noticed that every time we create a class, we've been marking it as public. Say public class, whatever. Um, so, you know, usually at the, around this point in the semester, somebody asks, can I create a private class in Java? And the answer is no. I can't create a private outer class in Java. Because if I create a private class, nobody would be able to call the constructor. And therefore, no one could create an instance of that class, and it's not very useful, okay? We do have a related concept called nested classes, and that is something that I'll pick up with uh, when we get to that point in the semester where we need it. For now, I will see you guys on Monday. We'll talk about interfaces. Please start MP2 if you haven't already and get some work done on it this weekend. Um, it's due before spring break.